Hello, welcome back to Modern Papist. My name is Ryan. We're going to be talking with Father Eric today, and my son's going to be watching because sometimes you just got to roll with it. <laughs> so today we're going to be talking about uh, religious orders. All right, so when it came to discerning whether to be a diocesan priest or an ordered priest, what was your what was your thought process? <clears throat> well, I um, I did spend a weekend with a religious order just to um, just to get a sense in prayer if that's what God wanted. And uh, the one I had felt uh, par partial draw to was the Jesuits. Um, so I <clears throat> spent a weekend uh, with them because they're novitiate. That is the beginning, you know, uh, um, the beginning basically near the beginning of their, um, uh, when they were formed uh, as Jesuits. Um, I, their house is around the, in the Detroit area. So I spent some time, like a weekend with them, and because um, uh, I wanted to at least uh, check out a religious order. And uh, it just kind of made it clear, you know, to me that, uh, that, it was, that I was meant to uh, enter to become a diocesan priest or a secular priest, as the technical term is, uh, which sounds like a contradiction, um, but it just means that you don't make religious vows. You make promises, actually, is what the difference is. A diocesan priest makes promises to his bishop rather than vows. Uh, it's not less binding, really, but it's um, but it's a, there is a difference there because we don't make a vow of uh, poverty because we're expected to take care of ourselves. Um, you know, like, uh, there's a retirement fund for priests, but it wouldn't be enough to support a priest, so we're encouraged to get our own retirement. <clears throat> so uh, did, you, do you have, did you have access to, like, the Dominicans and Franciscans, the other well-known orders, or was it just simply looking at the Jesuits and saying, all right, well, from this standpoint... This type of life isn't something I'm. I, I think I'm called to do. Well, I mean, I didn't really have access to the Dominicans, uh, for example. A lot of their vocations come from the very fact that you have to even know that they exist, first of all, um, for them right. to even get vocations. <clears throat> so often, if they run a school, it's a little easier for them to be known um, that they. Or an order that's around. But a lot of orders. I could have gone to like another state if I wanted to check out like Dominicans, right? Um, <clears throat> or Franciscans. There are Franciscans in the area. Um, you know, Capuchins are in the area, mm -hmm. um, and it's their province, kind of like what we think of as a diocese. But uh, their province is centered in Detroit, but their provinces are a lot bigger than a diocese, geographically speaking. Yeah. So, in regards to your fellow classmates, do you know anybody that went off to join an order, or was it primarily an only diocesan? Um, <clears throat> there were some guys that, uh, maybe one or two, that were in the seminary uh, when I was, and they had discerned that, they, um, that Jesus was calling them to uh, leave the seminary. But they they didn't know either if they were called the marriage. Uh, but some of them might have thought that they I don't know if they pursued it. You know if they had been called to religious life. Right. Um, uh, yeah, but I just don't know somebody specifically who had done that. I do know some priests, not personally, but in the diocese over the years, where some of them entered a religious order. Um, and then sometimes you get a priest from a religious order. Uh, like there's one that was a Trappist monk, which is one of the most austere um, uh, monks <clears throat> who have become a diocesan priest. And some others too that were monks, but they didn't go all the way through. They yeah. didn't make their perpetual vows yet, uh, and they became uh, diocesan priests. Can it go the other way? Where a diocesan priest yeah, chooses like, to become, like I said, I can only think I can think of about one um, 
that have got, become a religious order priest. Mm-hmm. Um, now, sometimes, you know, uh, I think there's another one too that became a Benedictine uh, <clears throat> and entered a monastery, but he was a lot closer to retirement. And that's in the history of the church, that's not completely unheard of. A lot of bishops would do that, where they would enter a monastery for the rest of their life, you know, to prepare for death. Yeah. Pope Benedict was going to do that uh, as a cardinal until, um, or he was going to do that, I think, at some point, and then Pope St. John Paul II had, uh, you know, basically told him, no, <laughs> I need you to do this, you know, and he ended up being like his right hand man. You know, the head of the congregation for the doctrine of the faith, and then, as we know, became pope. Right. Um, but obviously, choosing a name Benedict has some connotation with Benedictine yeah. monastic life too, is and building society, rebuilding Christendom. I guess on, on a kind of a tangent, what do you think when it comes to orders? Like, because there's this kind of caricature of those that go to monasteries and do that. You know, how would you? kind of describe that from your own experience from where you are as a as a pastor of a of a parish. Uh, what do you mean specifically more um, you know the life of a <clears throat> monastery, you know, cloister oh, okay. type of situation. You mean the difference or Yeah, like how how would you explain it? Because there there's this, you know, they're off and they're wasting their time. Oh, right. or you know something like that, and, and people don't see the people practicality. Yeah, people don't see the practicality of it. Yeah, I mean a lot of there are a lot of religious orders that are do external work. They would call it external, like teaching. <clears throat> you know, like Dominicans, uh, Jesuits are known for teaching. <laughs> you know, especially um, some of them better than others, um, uh, and. You know, uh, like we had like two really uh, solid Jesuits at the seminary that taught. Um, they didn't really live in community, though. You know, um, with each other there, they had each other there. Yep. And then there was a time where there were more Dominicans in the seminary than there were Jesuits, and there's always a lot of humorous um, banter between the two yeah. <clears throat> orders. But, you know, a lot of those are the ones that people see, and Franciscans, they see them, they're technically... You know, mostly friars who uh, they don't live in a monastery, strictly speaking. But originally, there really only were like well, originally there's basically <clears throat> only diocesan. They didn't call it diocesan. Uh, but then the Benedictines were basically the only type of religious order there was. Mm-hmm. You became a monk. Um, yeah. You either did parish work or you became a monk. Um, and that was it until the Franciscans and Dominicans. And then that started to branch out in terms of what they could do. Now, a lot of people look at <clears throat> people like, it's probably one of the best examples, the Carthusians. Uh, they're the strictest uh, religious order in terms of their austerity. They only talk to each other once a week um, when they have recreation time. Even their mass is quieter, uh, even what they say. And the in the office, that is the liturgy of the hours. Uh, they, of course, they pray like uh, eight hours of it, not eight hours straight, but eight. Uh, they're called hours in the liturgy of the hours. They're not all an hour long. Yep. Uh, but <clears throat> and they, nobody really ever sees these guys. Um, I mean, maybe somebody who's discerning to enter Carthusians might be one of the few people who sees them. Uh, there is a great movie called Into Great Silence about the Carthusians uh, at their mother house in Chartreuse, or Char- uh, Chartreuse France. Um, um, <clears throat> and that's, that's where the, the liqueur comes from, because they invented that. And they, they can be seen by not just uh, secular people, but a lot of people in the church can see them as like, well, it's a waste of time. Why are they in there? It's like, like Pope St. John Paul II said, you know, the, the cloistered monasteries are the pillars, are, are part of the pillars of the church that hold up the church, uh, their prayer. Their very life itself is a prayer because they, being hidden, you know, visibly hidden from others, 
you're basically living the life of the Holy Family in a sense, uh, where for many decades nobody knew, we don't know anything about the Holy Family. They just lived in, you know, near poverty, you know, working, uh, not very well known, um, and simplicity. You know, so these uh, Carthusians, as being the most extreme example, um, <clears throat> they're basically hermits who live in a community. They pray together, but they live in their own hermitage that's connected. Um, so their, you know, so their prayers are incredibly important. Uh, they're, uh, we have cloistered Carmelite nuns in Clinton Township, mm -hmm. uh, close by. Uh, they. Uh, their prayers are incredibly important. One of the first masses I said as a priest was at their monastery. Mm -hmm. And then after I met with them, they're on one side of the grill. I was on the other. It's not because they're like clamoring to get out like wild animals. They're, it's really symbolic to them. Um, and actually any man who tries to enter a cloister would be excommunicated uh, unless he's given permission by the bishop. Wow, really? Yeah, I think only the bishop can enter a cloister without anyone's else permission because he's the one who gives it. Right. This protection <clears throat> yep. for not only not only just their like well being, but it's protection for their vows. You know, that they this is part of their vows is that they live in obscurity. Uh but they but they pray um and their whole lives are, it's so entwined with prayer, their work and their prayer are just so closely connected <clears throat> that every single part of their day is like prayer, uh, and that the value is, you know, limitless the, of that prayer in the cloistered monasteries. I mean, sometimes I might think, oh, it'd be great to be a monk, but that's usually when I'm frustrated with, with the responsibilities <laughs> of being a pastor yeah. and having to, you know, respond to public things and having to pay attention to the news and all that stuff. They know the news in monasteries, so they can pray for things. Yeah, but yeah. it's usually like maybe one person, uh, and there's different degrees of how intense their obscurity is or how intense their isolation is. Yep. Uh, but they're with God. They're basically alone with God and each other. So they still live, unless, except for hermits, they, which is not a very common thing. But they still they live in a community. Yeah, I, um, this reminds me of something that was told me when I was young, which was... Um, the effect of demon, demons would be much more prevalent if it weren't for the prayers of the cloistered nuns. I yeah. mean, I guess that's redundant because nuns imply a cloisteredness, but but yeah, the term yeah. nun specifically means cloistered sister, a religious like sister who lives in a cloister. Yeah, so um, it's so yeah, so nun. religious sister is technically the term you use for somebody who doesn't live in a cloister, who's a vowed, you know, religious woman. Right. So, uh, I guess in terms of the orders, as a layman, it just kind of seems like when it comes to your choice, you know, like, and when I present this to my kids, because, you know, I've got kids, um, and I'm, I'm trying to introduce them to orders, um, this, these all seem to be a diverse way of, uh, a diverse path one can choose to attain <clears throat> holiness within the church and where God's calling them. I mean, ultimately, yeah. it's where, where God's calling them, but, I mean, there's also a, this, this, what looks to be a wonderful diversity in terms of, um, you know, I'm sure there's some, some sort of characteristics that kind of go along with Franciscans as there are with Jesuits and... Dominicans and, and all the others that you know certain types of people are called to those vocations or within those orders so I, I, I think that's it's kind of neat to think about because I mean a lot of people will just well my experience is with my diocesan priest but there's so much more than that and I think that that's something that should be more well known more publicized because yeah. obviously you know, word of mouth seems to be failing here, um, at least from my my viewpoint. But that's yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that. Well, the internet definitely helps, you know, with people knowing more about and like you, especially cloistered and and, and you get life. like you get places like Steubenville where they're a Catholic 
follow the magisterium, Franciscan student, you know, Franciscan University. Yeah, there might be some. And there are some professors who are exceptions, but well, right. But then you've got other other ordered uh, order, ordered schools that uh, have the name, but don't necessarily teach no. doctrine or what the faith is, and that's really unfortunate. So um, it, it's just a matter of you know some of these names are prevalent because of the schools, football even, but like you know. At the end of the day, like there's so much more than what's what most people know, and it's really unfortunate because you'd think there'd be more people because of the internet. We'd be we we'd have more access to it, but that's just not the case right now. So yeah, there's a uh, I get my coffee from <clears throat> a now most male most male Carmelites in the Carmelite order. Are friars meaning they they don't live in a monastery, whereas most Carmelite females are cloistered, you know, are nuns. Uh, some of them aren't, but um, I get my coffee from some in Wyoming. They're the only. There might be one other one. They're the only like cloistered male Carmelites. Originally, the Carmelites were all monks. Yeah. Um, in Mar Mount Carmel, in the Holy Land. Uh, and so these guys in Wyoming, uh, they're uh, cloistered monks, and one of the things they do is roast coffee, uh, and they also raise horses. <coughs> and okay, yeah, I mean they're really uh, very traditional. Um, they celebrate the Carmelite rite, which is kind of like the extraordinary form, very similar to the Tridentine Mass with some differences. Mm -hmm. Like instead of the Oran's position, they stand cruciform. And um, uh, there's a Dominican rite too, and uh, there's so much richness, you know, to the church's history, especially with all the orders. There's some orders that don't exist anymore that used to, um, like the Knights Templar, who were awesome because they were <laughs> they were a military religious order. Yeah, they um, um... they weren't there to like conquer and take over lands for their own gain. They're they're developed. Primarily to protect pilgrims who are going to the Holy Land, right? Um, and they were monks, like they they were celibate. Yeah. They uh, even one of their rules was fascinating. One reason they could be late for um, you know for one of the hours of the liturgy, of the hours. Uh, one reason why they could be late, an excuse, was if they're finishing a sword, finishing make like finishing uh, smithing a sword. <laughs> or, or something to do with their horse. Oh, and, and, wow. Like, their punishment was extreme if they neglected their horse. Um, and uh, so, I mean, it was a fascinating, you know, order. But it wasn't needed anymore um, after, you know, after the Crusades were over and after people were going to the Holy Land. I mean, Friday the 13th didn't help either. Oh, yeah. Yeah, with the, uh, <laughs> like the, French, that was... the French The French king wanted their money because they would hold on to people's money. Who is where a lot of banking systems started too. Yeah. They hold on to people's money in the Holy Land to protect them so they don't be robbed. And some of those people would never come back because they might die. Yep. And then they'd still have that money. And um, I can't remember which king it was. Um, but it was I don't French. remember. It was, it was a, a French king. Late 1400s, I think. It was a French king that um, tried them for heresy and made up a bunch of lies so that he could steal the money. And on Friday the 13th, <clears throat> every official that had arresting power opened up a letter and said to arrest any Knights Templar. Oh. And that's where the Friday 13th comes from. That's right. Um, because it was very, very unfortunate for the Knights Templar. And like you said, they're monks. They're, it's a religious order, so it's not... It's not like they were just a bunch of men that were just hanging out. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, alright, so getting back... Um, you know, this idea of, you know, the religious order is, is very fascinating to me. And I'm thinking about doing, especially at the behest of a friend of mine, of kind of going through religious orders. And so I'm going to try to kind of do a, a quick summary in oh, the future good. of the religious orders, because I think that's important. I think it needs to get out there. Um, and I think just doing a summary and explaining the orders, even if they're extinct, you know, like the Knights Templar, is is very crucial for us just to understand orders in general because I think 
especially in our generation, that seems to have been lost. Yeah. And um, you know, there's a few orders that we know of, but I mean, very few people would be able to actually tell the difference between them, and that's that's unfortunate because they do have their own identity and and um, their own way of life. And, and I don't think another thing that's good to say is there. <clears throat> you had hinted on it before, or touched on it. There. They each have their own charism, their own supernatural gift that God gives them, uh, whether it be teaching, taking care of the elderly, like the little sisters of the poor, who take care of a lot of elderly. Um, they're, the, um, they're the target uh, from President Obama at the time uh, to try to force them to provide contraceptives. Uh, and uh, thankfully, our current president has been protecting them. Uh, but they... Um, that's just like there's so many different charisms. You know, some of them are strictly more evangelization. There's <clears throat> there's one in the archdiocese that's well. There's a couple of fledgling orders uh, in the archdiocese right now, uh, and one of them would be strictly about evangelization, uh, and uh, you know, another is focused on uh, God's mercy, uh, on His divine mercy, and Saint Faustina's message that God or that Jesus gave through her um, uh, to people uh, so there's there's many charisms and you know there's some jokes that say only God knows how many Franciscan orders there are uh, <laughs> there's like so many branches of the Franciscans um, and uh, uh, but they the idea is that often with a religious order there's a need that's needed in a certain time period and it's fulfilled by God inspiring somebody to found an order. Uh, and then sometimes once that need is done, then they, they kind of fade into the background or, <clears throat> or it develops, uh, just as there's some Dominican sisters who are actually nuns who are cloistered in Farmington Hills, but most Dominican sisters are external, right? Um, you know, such as the Dominican sisters of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist in uh, Ann Arbor, and there's three of them at a school close to St. Basil's, too, because they came to give a, a talk on uh, vocations at the end of Mass um, about a year ago. Can you, uh, can you give a blessing for us? Sure. Uh, the Lord be with you. With your spirit. Through the intercession of uh, St. Basil the Great, uh, St. Anthony Mary Claret, May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father, for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us. Hopefully you learned something. Um, if you did, please like and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions, please write them below. Uh, I'm gonna, I, I'll make sure to copy whatever video that we do follow based off that suggestion into the next comment so you know about it. Thanks for joining us tonight. Have a great night. Or a great day. Whatever. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>